the 1940s, a decade of change. How do you do there, folks? Thank you for turning to a highly procrastinating project. As always, I'm your host. Boy oh boy, the 1940s were a doozy. World War II, the fear of communism, the formation of both the United Nations and NATO, along with the invention of the Slinky, the 1940s rocked the globe as a whole. Speaking of which, the Slinky was invented in November of 1945 by Richard T. James. This is one of the many astounding inventions from the 40s, such as Silly Putty, created by James Wright in 1943. The Polaroid camera was created February 21st, 1947 by inventor Edwin Land. The hipster was soon invented after. The first electronic digital computer, the Atanasoff Berry computer, was invented in 1942 in Iowa State University. These were some of the many things that were invented in the 1940s. <coughs> sports! Throughout the 1940s, there were many popular sports such as football, basketball, and ski ball. But the most popular decade was none other than baseball. Baseball was so popular in America that actually people were very concerned about it disappearing over the course of World War II. As a response to a letter that was written to him, Franklin D. Roosevelt wrote what would become the Green Light Letter, stating that he felt that it would be best for the country to keep baseball going, as it provides a recreation which does not last over two hours or two hours and a half, and which can be got for very little cost. This brought hope to many fans of the game as they feared, due to World War II, with all their favorite players being drafted, it just would not be able to keep it happening. Baseball. Be dead. Now you might be wondering why would baseball ever die? Well, during the war, men between 18 years old and 26 years old were expected to serve in the army, taking many professional athletes into the service. To prevent parks from financially collapsing, Philip Brinkley created the Ag Pickle otherwise known as the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League in 1943. The Ag Pibble started off with four teams of 16 players, but then it became so popular that it grew to having 10 teams of 16 players and over 900,000 paying fans. It is nearly impossible for someone to talk about sports in the 40s and not talk about Jaggy Robinson. Joe Lewis was seen as an American hero as he was the only man to ever reign as heavyweight champion for over a decade. Joe Lewis stood as a symbol for American traits such as racial unity and national pride. He wanted to serve as a role model that you can still have good sportsmanship even in a sport as violent as boxing. Throughout the 1940s, many Americans joined, enjoyed animated films in their pastime. Well-known classics such as Pinocchio and Bam <coughs> Bambi were introduced and were very successful. Films and movie theaters were also very successful as a whole. It really upped morale and made people happy because they could just relax, focus on the movie, enjoy themselves, and then the scene with Bambi's mom happens, and then they can't do that anymore. Way to go, Disney! But eventually, you didn't even need to worry about going to the theater anymore. In 1947, the television finally came to America, and it created a craze that took over America as a whole. Practically everyone wanted to own a television. Television productions influenced people's lives as a whole, as they would adjust their daily schedule just to fit in their program. Shows such as Mary Kay and Johnny, which was the first sitcom to broadcast on any American television network, Far Away Hill, which was the first soap opera on American television network, and Texaco Star Theater really took over, and you can't leave the kids out, Shows like how do you how Oh god, I mean an adult. When Americans weren't watching television or sports, they might have been listening to the radio for entertainment. However, World War II created federal broadcasting policies that restricted what radio stations could really broadcast. They didn't want anyone broadcasting any weather conditions as the enemy might be listening in. But, luckily, not many radio stations did that, and many more broadcasted music. Music in the 1940s was mostly built around jazz and big band style bands.
Artists from this decade tried their best to maintain morale and, you know, keep Americans' minds off of the war. The big band style of music was most prominent throughout the 1940s, as legends like the Dorsey Brothers were very popular. Jimmy Dorsey's orchestra was one of the first musical acts to sell millions of albums, and Tommy Dorsey was a very popular trombonist who, who had his own orchestra. Scat style was also very popular, however. Scat singing was usually used with jazz instruments, creating a style known as bebop. Dizzy Giuseppe was one of the people who helped create this style, along with the Afro-Cuban music trend. This type of music sparked the creation of the ever so elegant Zoot Suit. Economy! By December 8, 1941, the United States shifted into a full-on war economy. Factories across the nation were transformed in order to build military equipment. There was restriction of resources necessary to produce as much military equipment as we needed. Because of this, many civilian products were restricted and rations were created. But, on the bright side, unemployment seemingly disappeared. Women went to work in factories, revolutionizing how women were seen throughout the country as a whole. Many were not even working for the economic incentives, they were working so they could benefit by learning new skills, contributing to the public good, and proving themselves in jobs once thought as only men's work. A whopping 18 million women were working by the, by the end of World War II. For much of the 40s, rationing was very necessary. It was necessary because there was a 17% drop of people working on farms as they were fighting in the war or they were you know, working in a war production plant. And extra food was needed to feed the troops, along with countries that had provided certain foods like sugar were now under control of the enemy. People received ration books which had coupons for certain items like sugar, coffee, butter, etc. And the coupons in the book allowed you to buy the item in store, but if you had the money to afford that item but you did not have the coupon, you would not be able to buy that item. Meat rationing started around March of 1942. The American armed forces needed a lot of meat to feed their troops, leading the shortages of meat at home. For families who were used to eating meat basically every meal, this was a dramatic change. It easily could have been worse. Now on to important events of the 1940s. For those of you who don't know, World War II was essentially started because a certain someone wasn't happy with the ending of World War I. Germany was left crippled with financial sanctions and territorial disembarment because the entire war was blamed on them, and also Austria-Hungary. Hitler was left in disgust with Germany's surrender and looked for a new focus, bigger than his military career. After a few years in the German Workers' Party, Hitler became super popular and highly supported in Germany. After even more years, he became the self-appointed Fuhrer of Germany. Hitler now craved domination of Europe. Ooh. Ooh. Hitler saw what he wanted, and thus, World War II began. On September 1st, 1939, Germany invaded Poland. As I said earlier, the 1940s were a decade of change. Many Americans' lives were entirely flipped upside down because of the war. At first, the United States did not want to get involved with the war at all. We were just starting to recover from the Great Depression. FDR even promised during his campaign for the presidency that he would not send American soldiers into foreign wars again. We were still willing to help out Great Britain, though, as they were running out of military equipment, running out of food, and just generally struggling. We were able to do this with the Lend-Lease Act that was passed March of 1941. Essentially, FDR felt that no involvement was the best involvement in World War II. But that all changed once Pearl Harbor happened in December of 1941. With a roaring, Oh girl, you did not just go there! He told Britain to hold his earrings, and he officially declared war on the Imperial Government of Japan. Stating, to bring the conflict to a successful termination, all the resources of the country are hereby pledged by the Congress of the United States. In quotes. Many months later. Throughout the world, throngs of people hail the end of the war in Europe. 
It is five years and more since Hitler marched into Poland. Years full of suffering and death and sacrifice. Now the war against Germany is won. A grateful nation gives thanks for victory. Hundreds of thousands crowd into American churches to give thanks to God. President Truman announced the official surrender. This is a solemn but glorious hour. I wish that Franklin D. Roosevelt had lived to see this day. General Eisenhower informs me that the forces of Germany have surrendered to the United Nations. The flags of freedom fly all over Europe. For this victory, we join in offering our thanks to the providence which has guided and sustained us through the dark days of adversity and into light. Much remains to be done. The victory won in the West must now be won in the East. The whole world must be cleansed of the evil from which half the world has been freed. United, the peace-loving nations have demonstrated in the West that their arms are stronger by far than the might of dictators or the tyranny of military cliques that once called us soft and weak. The power of our people to defend themselves against all enemies will be proved in the Pacific War as it was proved in Europe. In a symbolic gesture, American troops destroy the Nazi party emblem. Now you may be wondering, why did we keep fighting Japan if Germany surrendered? Well, the fact of the matter was that Japan and Germany were not linked, such as the Allies were. The Allies were linked in war as one general like team, I guess you could consider it. But Japan and Germany had completely different aims. Our, so our war with Japan continued until we unveiled probably the most terrifying weapon that's ever been used or imagined in the history of ever. We unveiled the atomic bomb. Due to Japanese military leaders rejecting the 13-part surrender declaration, we decided to drop little leaflets throughout Hiroshima, and then we decided, since we're so morally correct to drop little leaflets, we decided to drop an atomic bomb on them. Here's actual footage. Um, viewer discretion is absolutely advised. We did it, America. We saved the world. Wait, wait, hold on. The Soviet Union uses communism? <coughs> oh man, I must be getting a... Cold War. <laughs> so Russia and the United States were allies throughout the war, but we are more fake friends than anything else. So, many people believe that the start of the Cold War was the Yalta Conference. We discovered that we had radically different theories on government. Truman created the Marshall Plan in order to help Europe rebuild after World War II. But really, he just wanted to prevent communism from taking over the world. Tensions between the Soviet Union and us got even worse when we decided to join NATO with many other European nations. The Soviet Union, being the edgy teenager that they are, then responded with the Warsaw Pact, basically creating the Iron Curtain. The Soviet Union essentially cut itself off from the rest of the world. No one really knew anything about them besides that they had equally scary bombs, hated the United States, and had a mad collection of Hot Topic wristbands. Now why didn't we just go to war with the Soviet Union? Well, the fact that we're scared of them because they handled Germany like this. Down. 
and both us and the Soviet Union knew that nuclear war would spell the end of the world. So we just kind of dropped it. Except we didn't really ever drop it. We still had a Cold War going on for a couple more years. <laughs> but I'm just the 40s, man. <laughs> that ain't none of my business. I'm going to stay out of that. But on a happier note, other non-war related events in the 1940s are the first issue of Captain America was released in March of 1941. In 1943, the Pentagon's intense building process finally came to an end and the building was complete. In 1946, department stores started selling Tupperware. In 1949, 45 RPM records were introduced. And on November 17th, 1944, the second coming of Christ, um, I mean the birth of Danny DeVito occurred. Many other famous celebrities were born in this decade, such as David Bowie, Arnold Schwarzenegger, Stephen Hawking, and Donald Trump. Not really a whole lot happened specifically in Pennsylvania in the 1940s, but the electronic numerical integrator and computer, the first programmable electronic computer, is unveiled at the University of Pennsylvania in 1946. In the 40s, Olmsted Field became a prisoner of war camp, but it is now the Harrisburg Air National Guard base. Here's a photo of Amy and Mary Rose Linditch working at the Pennsylvania Railroad as car repairman helpers in Pitcairn, Pennsylvania. In the year 1940, the Portland Cement Association released a documentary film of the construction of the Pennsylvania Turnpike. A whole lot of fun. And lastly, the elegant Joe Biden was born November 20th, 1942 in Scranton, Pennsylvania. The 1940s overall were a great change of decade were a great decade of change were a decade of great change and patriotism. And also they made Cheerios. I eat Cheerios because they're heart healthy and um my heart has been severely damaged. So um Rebecca, if you're out there watching or listening to this, can you please return my call?